Good evening, everyone, Good evening. and welcome to Borough Hall. My name is Tanya Cantlow, and I am the acting counsel to the borough president. To my right is Ina Gusenfeld, who's the land use coordinator, and to my left, Richard Barrick, who is the land use director. There are four items on the agenda this evening. Please note that this hearing is being recorded to comply with the public law for transparency. It will be available for viewing on Borough President Adams' website brooklyn-usa.org or on the One Brooklyn channel on YouTube. Again, web viewers may submit timely comments to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov for Borough President Adams' consideration. Please call the first item and let us begin. Calendar item number 1190438ZMK. This application submitted by Pulmonary and Sleep Medical PC pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for a zoning map amendment to change the southeast portion of a block on Avenue O between Bedford Avenue and East 26th Street in Brooklyn Community District 14 from an R2 to an R3-2 district. Such action would achieve zoning compliance and conformance for a property consisting of two semi-detached homes, including one with a ground floor ambulatory medical facility and a single family residence above. Community Board 14 voted to disapprove this application on November 4th, 2019. Would Richard Lobel, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Good evening, thank you. Richard Lobel from the law firm of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Thank you for having us here this evening and thank you to the uh, Brooklyn Borough President's Office. We're here today to discuss the 2513 to 2523 Avenue O rezoning. This is a rezoning which, as was stated previously, would encompass four lots located on Avenue O between East 26th Street and Nostrand Avenues. So the first map that is shown is the zoning map. You'll see in the circled area that there is a, uh, there is a currently an R7A district to the south of the site as well as to the east of the site, while the site itself is zoned R2. Uh, this property was the subject of uh, the uh, Midwood rezoning in 2006. And so formally, much of the area, including the site, was, was zoned R6. In the subsequent rezoning, it was rezoned to an R2. So you can see the area, the proposed rezoning, the four lots, they uh, total roughly 10,000 square feet of lot area. And the proposal would rezone them from the existing R2 to an R32. As we'll discuss in further detail, the bulk regulations affecting the R2 and R32 districts are largely the same, with the major difference for purposes of this application being that in the current R2 district, medical offices are not permitted, while in the R32 district, medical offices would be permitted as of right. Uh, this is particularly pertinent to the applicant, who himself is a doctor and has uh, medical offices on lots one and two of the site. So you can see from the land use of the area that you're in an area where much of the development to the east and south of the site is dense. There are six-story buildings, nine-story buildings. This is, uh, was typical for the R6 and is contextual within the R7A. And most immediately across from the site is the New York Community Hospital, a, a five- and six-story building with uh, facilities uh, totaling greater than 130,000 square feet. The actual zoning change map is seen before you. It's a very small, uh, effective zoning of the map. It's basically taking this 100 by 100 parcel, rezoning it to, uh, to an R32 district. So we have a permitted and required uh, comparison table under the existing and proposed zoning. And as you can see, most of the, uh, the bulk regulations remain largely similar. The maximum FAR for residential and community facilities remain the same. The yards uh, generally remain the same. There are slight variations in the height uh, with a maximum cap in the R32 and a sky exposure plane in the R2, existing R2. Uh, so again, this is really not a rezoning which is being done for bulk but for use. Most importantly, when you take a look at the applicant's site as well as pictures surrounding the site, 
You can see these were taken uh, in July 2018, and this represents really general conditions in the area. And you can see from across the street at the hospital, we are across from the emergency room to New York Community Hospital. And just, again, from random pictures taken at the time, you'll notice you know, no fewer than three uh, ambulances which appear there. This is a very dense and actively used area. There is ambulance traffic constantly at, uh, in the area of the site, which is one of the reasons we think that the proposed rezoning is so appropriate. You can see the view across the street from the site, uh, south side of Avenue O. This is the, the, uh, the emergency room. There are sirens night and day. This is a very uh, active thoroughfare. This is a, on, a, on a street which, you know, on which there is a lot of hospital traffic. This is why we think the R32 is particularly appropriate here in that a legalization of the doctor's offices here uh, would allow for um, a condition which is quite uh, consistent with a hospital across the street. Indeed, uh, Dr. Sony, the applicant, his practice has many patients who, um, but for his practice, would need to go to the emergency room across the street. So um, we were very happy to get the vote in favor by the Land Use Committee of Community Board 14, 17 to 7 to 2 in favor, uh, although the full board failed to carry that uh, approval through. So we'd be happy to answer any questions. Just want to point out for those who just walked in the room, if you plan to speak on particular calendar items, we have speaker slips up by the front. Okay. Mr. Lobel, so we have uh, actually four questions sure. on behalf of the borough president. The first, non-conforming detached buildings are not allowed to be enlarged under the existing R2 detached single family home zoning. The first question, what additional development rights would these buildings gain under the proposed R3-2 zoning? So the, the R2 and R3-2 is, are very similar in bulk. And indeed, many of the homes, probably a majority of the lots on this block are not R2 conforming uses, they're, they're detached homes uh, which violate bulk and use regulations of the R2 zoning district. But as far as additional development rights, um, the community facility uses generally in an R3-2 could exist at an FAR of 1 uh, as of right, whereas in the R2 district that would be a 0.5 with the availability of a 1 FAR uh, in the event of a special permit. So um, I wouldn't really say that there are that the development rights are material as far as what's gained and lost. In fact, in the R2 district, um, a residential building through special permit can be built here in FAR 1. That's pursuant to the zoning special permit 73622. Uh, whereas in the, in the R3-2, you would only be able to get a 0.5 FAR for that residential. So again, while there's some shifting of the uses, the development rights remain largely the same. Okay. And so what additional uses would be allowed um according to the proposed rezoning? Sure, so um, the, while the R2 allows for a host of community facility uses, there are certain community facility uses which are not permitted uh, in, in an R2 district. Those include the medical offices in question, they include certain other community facility uses, colleges or universities, uh, hospitals and related facilities, et cetera. So there's a, um, there's a uh, uh, as far as the additional uses that would be allowed, those are community facility uses that would not require the benefit of a special permit or would be allowed uh, as of right uh, within the R32. I would note, though, that nonprofit or voluntary hospitals uh, are allowed in the current zoning district, the, R the R2, as well as under the R32. So, and this is important for not only the reason that there exists New York Community Hospital across the street, but that as a matter of public record, New York Community Hospital owns one of the lots within the rezoning area. Okay, and the third question, what is the total existing square footage of community facility use at that property? So the existing uh, community facility square, square footage, as is noted in, I believe in the first um, zoning sheet, uh, there's currently 1,424 1424 square feet of community facility use in the form of the doctor's offices existing on lots one and two. And just uh, for purposes of review, that's uh, that number appears here. The 1,424? Correct. Correct. Okay. Do you have any? Okay. Uh, and the last question, given that the two buildings in the proposed rezoning are semi-detached residential structures, why was R3-1A district that is meant for the semi-detached semi residences 
and permits up to 1,500 square feet of community facility use not proposed? So when we started the rezoning, we had a thorough discussion with the Department of City Planning regarding the appropriate zoning district. And I think that the, um, the very intensive use across a wide street, Avenue O being 80 feet wide, as well as the uh, community hospital across the street, really kind of uh, would mitigate in favor of a, a denser R32 as opposed to an R31. Um, the, the R32 district appears, as you can see, widely throughout the area, whereas the R31 does not. Um, and moreover, to the, to the extent that the current square footage amounts to 1,424 square feet, uh, the R31 would allow up to 1,500 square feet for medical office and would not allow anything beyond that. So in truth, uh, if the doctor wanted to use additional space for back office and other uses, uh, that would be permitted under the R32, whereas in the R31 it would be capped out at an additional 76 square feet. So we understand there's been a lot of discussion around this. Um, you know, we're, we're, again, remorseful that the community board did not carry the land use committee vote. We understand that uh, I think there are probably are um, certain parties who would prefer an R31 because that would fix the existing development. Um, but, but as far as our initial discussion was concerned, those reasons are why we picked the R32. So when you mention the additional density, the R31 and the R32 have the exact same residential density. They both have the exact same community facility density. So if you could explain the nuance of the density rationale you Sure. Up. It's really that the R31 allows for, uh, would not allow for greater than 1,500 square feet of medical office. The R3, the R32 <laughs> is, the, is the lowest density district, which permits uh, a greater than that 1,500 square feet. So, um, so really, uh, as Mr. Barrick points out, the, the, uh, the density issue is, is very similar between the R31 and R32. So, so, it's per so particularly it's the medical flexibility. Office of the ambulatory medical Correct. density that's, that we're talking about. Yes, that's primarily the, the issue. You good? Okay. All right. So that concludes the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Our first speaker, uh, Mo Dilla. Rami? Rami? Rosmi. Rosmi. Okay. Okay. Okay, so my name is Mohammed Razvi, and um, I work at a community-based organization, which is within the District 14. Uh, we service about 20,000 clients annually in our office, and uh, we support this application. Uh, we feel that it's a need for the community, um, and it's within the community range where Dr. Sony can help the community members. That's it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The next speaker, Abdul Aziz. Yeah. Okay. Hey, good evening, everybody. Good evening. My name is uh, Abdul Aziz Bhatt. I am from Pakistani American Merchant Association on Coney Island Avenue. So I am in favor of uh, Dr. Sony because his his idea is uh, for community, not for uh, himself. So I think. Uh, I know, I know him long time. Uh, I have a good relation with him. So if uh, borough president office agree with uh, this uh, project, thank you very much. Thank you. First name, Joel. I don't want to mess up. Tushiro. OK. Hi. Hi. Not Italian, though. Italian okay. would be a little harder. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Joel Tushiro, and just by my background, I'm, um, I lived in, in that community board for 25 years. I now live in Bay Ridge. I am a patient of Dr. Sony, and I just wanted to share a few things if I could. Um, while you're definitely dealing with the legalities of zoning as a community interest, I would also um, ask you to consider another community interest, and that is Dr. Sony is a unique physician. Now you say, how's that possible? He serves his community as a physician who is certified in eight different American board specialties. So he looks at patients holistically. He's not an, frankly, not an ordinary, I mean, God bless them, not an ordinary general practitioner. So he brings into that community 
expertise that just any old doctor does not have. I believe that's a community interest, hard interest. The second thing I would say is on the matter of, because I went to both uh, the land use uh, meeting and also the, the larger community board meeting, so I heard both sides, and I, and I spoke at the one where I could. Um, big concern by many of the neighbors on, East, particularly East 22nd Street, is the, the amount of traffic. But Dr. Sony is not the one who's bringing the traffic. As, as the council, as the uh, council, Mr. LaBelle said, it is that emergency room. And I'll, and I'll tell you one of the reasons, I'm, I'm a, a, a researcher uh, by practice. I'm his patients. I observe demography, demographics. When I go there, this gentleman, frankly, is a minority. The profile of his practice is probably 60% minority. Okay, there are white folks who go there, but he's serving a minority practice to that extent, I believe, maybe even more. And many of those people don't drive in, in excuse me, BMWs, okay, um, or Mer Mercedes, they, they use public transportation. Mm -hmm. Avenue, Avenue. So that's one other factor I'd like to just note. Finally, um, the emergency room has been there at least, the hospital has been there since 1929. It was originally a maternity hospital. But the emergency room was constructed in 1970. It's been there a long, long time. So it's not something that the, the neighborhood folks haven't seen in the past. I think there's a concern that Dr. Sony is somehow going to build this used facility. Well, he can't, as the, as the, the council said. There's, there are limitations. What he really wants to do is legitimize his space so he can continue to practice. And that's what I'd like to say. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there any additional speakers? Okay, hearing none, if Richard, if you can close the first calendar item. So we'll, we'll close the first uh, calendar item, but if people do show up later before we close tonight, we'll open it up to allow them to speak. Uh, so calendar item one now is closed. I'm just gonna change the presentation. Uh, calendar item number two, 190295ZMK. <laughs> This application submitted by Star and Stripes Holding Company pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for a zoning map amendment to establish a C1-3 commercial overlay within an existing R5B district on the western side of 13th Avenue at the southwest corner of its intersection with 82nd Street, extending halfway to 81st Street. Such action would legalize an existing non-conforming use group six law office at 8118 13th Avenue in Brooklyn Community District 10. Community Board 10 will vote on the application on November 18, 2019. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decisions until he hears from that board. Would Richard Lobel, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Richard Lobel from the law firm of Sheldon Lobel PZ, PC, representing the application. Good evening. Uh, we're here today to discuss the 8118 13th Avenue rezoning. Uh, Bill Santo, who's the applicant, is with us as well, and Fan Baton from my office is assisting the presentation. So. As you can see from the proposed project area, which is circled on the map, uh, 13th Avenue in this area is somewhat unique in that there are 17 blocks, 16 of which on the western portion of 13th Avenue in this area are covered by a C-13 commercial overlay, the one exception being our block. And so uh, after discussion with city planning, uh, it is the applicant's request that we place the same commercial overlay, a C-13 commercial overlay, on this frontage. You can see from the uh, tax map the particular area of the rezoning. This would encompass the applicant's lot highlighted in red as, long, as well as these two lots uh, to the corner of 82nd Street. So 13th Avenue, as you can see in this land use map, is actually kind of a collection of uh, various different use groups. Despite the commercial designation, the avenue retains commercial use on much of the frontage, but there are also residential uses which have chosen to uh, remain even in the face of the uh, existing and pre-existing commercial overlays. So we an actually anticipate 
on our lot and our, on the three lots on this frontage that this would remain a consistent condition, uh, particularly in light of the fact that we've got an existing commercial law office that exists on our site, highlighted in red, and there's existing two family buildings uh, to the south of the site. So again, you can see from the zoning change map that we have a prevailing R5B. I guess I would also mention that in addition to the C13 commercial overlay on the western portion of 13th Avenue here, there exist commercial overlays on a majority of those same uh, frontage, street frontages on the eastern portion of, the, of 13th Avenue. Uh, and, and again, these are just pictures of the development site as well as the buildings next door. As is mentioned in the materials, the, the building you see in the center, which is the applicant's building, currently houses a law office. This formerly was a democratic club and has been existing at the site since approximately 1956. The building itself was existing pursuant to a BSA variance granted at that time. The BSA variance at the time uh, ex explicitly included the uh, Democratic Club to be located there. The the uh, pr the variance at the time was not one for bulk. I'm sorry, was not one for use. It was for bulk. So the lot coverage at the site would have limited the ground floor to 2,200 square feet. The BSA found that the variance findings were met and permitted. Uh, an expansion of that flip footprint to encompass the what you see in front of you, which is roughly 2,800 square feet. <coughs> and so that's really the uh, crux of the application. And both I and uh, Fan and I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay. So we have actually two questions on behalf of the borough president. What additional uses would be allowed according to the proposed rezoning? Do you want to? Um, the proposed rezoning would permit um, use group six, um, five, six, uh, five is not permitted in a C1, it's three. So use group six is more local retail establishment and personal services. Okay, and to what extent is unenclosed commercial use allowed in the front and rear yards of the affected properties? So generally speaking, um, it's, it would just be for eating and drinking establishments as per the zoning resolution. Um, other uses in use group six have to be enclosed and within the building. Do you have anything? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any speakers for this calendar item that have not submitted a speaker slip? Okay, hearing none, will Richard please close this calendar item? Calendar item number two is closed. Calendar item number three, 190172 ZMK. Okay. This application submitted by 271 Seabreeze Development LLC, pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for a zoning map amendment establishing a C2-4 commercial overlay within an existing R6 district on the entirety of a block bounded by Seabreeze and West Brighton Avenues and West 2nd and West 5th Streets in Brooklyn Community District 13. Such action would facilitate two stories of commercial use totaling approximately 25,020 square feet in an approximately 20 story, 114 unit as of right mixed use development. Community Board 13, We'll vote on this application on November 20th, 2019. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decisions until he hears from the board. Would Eric Palatnik? Yep. The representative for this application, please state your name and present the and application. I just want to quickly acknowledge we have the land use co-chair from Community Board 13, Thank Marion Cleaver. Thank, thank you for coming. Good, good evening. My name is Eric Palatnik, and it's nice to see everybody both here and in the audience. And this is a very intimate presentation. Uh, we were at Community Board 13 last night, I'll note, and uh, the Land Use Committee, and I, and, and I, I hope I'll be echoed by, uh, by the present company, uh, voted to support the application last night. I believe it was unanimous, seven people voted for it. Uh, and I'm thrilled that they did, because the project, uh, the development that we're here for today is a, it's a rezoning to add a, a C24 overlay over the site. But it's really a lot more than that. Uh, it's a revitalize. It's a project and a development that's really going to revitalize and help to the uh, to help to see a resurgence in Asher Levy Park, which we understand is about to go under a, a tremendous renovation. Uh, and it's, it takes a block that's been historically, if you're staring at it right there, you can see it in the middle where it says site is the property that we're talking about. But you can see the block is sort of a. a a nondescript block where it's got parking for Trump Village on the far left, and then it's got some community facility uses, uh, some synagogues on the block, and then on the far right of the block, it's got some residential that's probably 
dates to the 50s. Uh, not much has changed on the block through the years except for the demolition of our site, which I understand is a former World War II uh, building of some sort. Our client is Sir Dryback. He's the one that's developing it. Uh, he's responsible for uh, doing a lot of great developments in this area of Community Board 15, including the El Greco Diner, which has become an, a, a very iconic corner now in Sheepshead Bay, where they did a beautiful plaza area with an outdoor seating area. That's going to be a part of this project, too, something very similar. So we're in a, a zoning district. We're in a uh, R6 zoning district. Uh, we currently have a building that's under construction at the site. You don't see it in these photos, unfortunately. But it's up, and it's 20 stories tall. It's already existing. It's built as of right. You're allowed to have a 20-story building there, and that's what the owner is developing. What we're asking you permission is on the ground floor of that building to take what the as of right condition is, which are these images here that I'm showing you. This is the ground floor. You're in a flood zone, so the ground floor in an R6 district cannot be resident. It can only be used for medical or community facility or for parking. So when the building is built, as it's filed right now at the Department of Buildings, these are the plans that it's been filed with at the New York City Department of Buildings. It doesn't look that appealing. What we're asking to do is to change it to that. That's what's being built right now. That's the permit that's in place. That's what's allowed to be built. That's what the zoning encourages. That's what we're asking to do. This area that you see out front right here is a plaza area. That fronts on the Seabreeze Avenue side to bring you back to the beginning so you can understand what's happening in a larger context. When you go back to the aerial, I'm sorry, I have to click through everything. If I get to these here, this shows you Seabreeze Avenue. If you look where it says the word breeze, that's where the plaza is going to be, right on the site there. It's going to actually indent into the plaza, past the L line into the site itself. It's going to front right on Astor Levy Park. So the idea is that we're creating some retail streetscape the beautiful plaza area that's going to look very similar to the El Greco site, which if you've been to is gorgeous, stunningly gorgeous. And that's what we're asking to do. We're not asking for that much commercial. We're asking you for a grand total of 25,000 square feet of commercial space. It's going to be located at the first and at the second floors. But you have to see the plan to understand me when I tell you that it's not that much commercial. Because really, it's a donut. This is the ground floor. Everything in light blue, which is my favorite color, is at the top and at the bottom. <coughs> That's the retail. That's it. It's not a Target. It's not a CVS. It's not a Dwayne Reed. It can't accommodate anything big. You're talking about a grand total of retail of uh, 26,000 square feet, 25,000 square feet, excuse me. And of that 25,000 square feet, you're looking right now at 9,000 square feet of it. The idea of it is to be engaging the community, local retail. Our motto is, or Sir Dryback's motto is, things you can't buy on Amazon. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, we are then, that will be enabled from, the, this is what will be enabled from your rezoning, this space that's in light blue. Also, should the rezoning be approved, the second floor will be allowed. That's all light blue, again, there, that's uh, all around. That's a full floor. That's proposed to be a gym. Mr. Rybeck is in talks with, with the gym. Uh, that is the business plan, and that is what it will be. We will be applying to the BSA for a special permit when this is over uh, and securing a special permit to have a gym there. So that's the commercial. The 25,000 square feet of commercial that we're asking for really is comprised of 9,000 square feet of local retail, 16,000 square feet of a gym. Now, why am I emphasizing all this? Because parking came up at the community board. It was vigorously discussed at the community board. We've been at the community board for over two years. We went there first in 2018 in the spring, and we were told very clearly by everybody on the board that no way in the world are they going to even consider this, even though we're not asking for anything related to parking. But they, we better show them what the parking is in the area around us and that this will not impact the parking. Even though we are providing 130 spaces and 118 are required, we're 12 over, and we're providing 25 parking spaces for the commercial spaces, this commercial space that we're creating. So we went out, we hired a traffic consultant who went out there as the community board directed us on the hottest summer day in August of 2018 because they told us don't go on a rainy day, don't go on a cloudy day, go on a sunny, hot day. And they did that and we prepared the report and we submitted it to them. We've been back to the community board twice since then discussing it and I think they were pleased and we were pleased too that we showed them that we're not having any negative impact. They also asked us to study various intersections around, around the property, which we did in the neighborhood, and again we showed them we had no uh, significant impact. Uh, I should call out to your attention that as a part of the development, the third floor is proposed, everything you're seeing in pink right there, is proposed to be community facility. Uh, 
We have spoken with the councilman who has asked if we could find some room in, in our hearts for some local Holocaust organizations to take some of that space, uh, some not-for-profits, not very much of that space, but some of it, and we've said yes, we'd be happy to. The rest of the space we're proposing to have to permitted community facility users. We have not identified any yet, but we'd imagine much the same way you heard about a doctor and the application that predated this, there are probably some type of medical uses and the most likely, because as you know, with the elimination of most of the hospitals in the area and the overcrowding of emergency rooms and the outsourcing of medical treatment, there's a tremendous demand for local medical services and outpatient services. So we'll probably do that. I'll call out the parking lot, which you can see on the right, right there, is attended parking. And just to take you uh, to an elevation of the building, this shows, of course, a schematic version, uh, but it's a 20-story building. Everything you're seeing in pink and blue represents the community facilities. The pink, the blue is what we're asking for the variant. The, is what we're asking for the rezoning to accommodate, not the variants. Uh, and that is our application. I'll look for, uh, there's an image of it. So this shows you the plaza in an image format. This, again, shows you the streetscape. We're trying to show you here that it's going to add some liveliness to the street. And this shows you the flood plain, the flood, uh, the rest of it is really just technical stuff. Uh, a couple of key points, too, that I wanted to raise for you. Uh, the facade and the, the building itself has been designed in a way that it's, it's quite beautiful. Mr. Rybeck has uh, done not just El Greco, but two other buildings in the Manhattan Beach Corridor that have all been recognized by everybody in the community as being stunning and well-designed, although some people might not agree that, to their taste, but most people feel it's good materials and well-designed. Uh, and that's, I think, everything that I could present to you. I hope I was very thorough. I know the 32 BJs here. I think they might be here for me. Uh, they're not, thank God. Not thank <laughs> God, but thank God that I'm not engaging uh, in a controversial matter with them. Uh, I like working with them very much. Uh, they've been a pleasure to work with uh, and growing more and more on me every time I do another application. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, let me, because I think you've answered some of these questions here. The first one that you talked about the gym. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I had a little bit of a heads up, so I, I yeah, tried okay. to work it in. So the experience for pedestrians walking along Brighton Beach Avenue is oh, hampered yeah. by the proximity of the elevated train structure. What elements are being incorporated in the building design that would improve lighting along the facade? Uh, everything that I was just talking about. Uh, that's one of the beautiful things about what we're doing. That's my best selling point. I think that's... That's what sells the development of what we're asking to do because it goes back to the imagery I was showing you before. Here, this is, that's what we're going to be creating. Uh, that's, that's what's allowed. Now, I think the uh, person who did the rendering took a little bit too much of a, of a liberty here in making this look like Gotham uh, and a little bit like Batman. Uh, but it does show you clearly that it's, uh, you know, this is not that inviting. Uh, this, on the other hand, is. Uh, if you imagine if you put the dogs and all the people in the other picture, it might look a little bit better, but it's still not, it still has cars and it still has steel grating and still has uh, nothing that's too attractive for the streetscape. So, you know, the elevated train, uh, even though I'm a big fan of the French Connection, is not the greatest looking thing in the world. Can you confirm if these are light fixtures? They are. Those are lighting and uh, it's going to be well lit. If you're after lighting, uh, the building is going to have architectural and accent lighting all around it. Uh, the street is going to be well lit. Uh, the planters are going to be filled not only with trees where the trees need to be, uh, uh, the, the tree planting boxes, but there will also be bioswells located within those. Uh, there will also be seasonal plantings all around the building, including winter flowers. Uh, so uh, all of that has been taken into consideration, uh, in not just in anticipation of what you're asking, but in our own recognition that being up against the elevated train is not very desirable uh, from a streetscape perspective. So we're trying to improve that. So why do you believe such uses would best serve the surrounding community? Oh, because people need things that aren't on Amazon. You need coffee, you need to get your shoes shined, you need to get laundry done, you need to have local services. And Oh, and the health club upstairs, that's, uh, some would see that as an attribute. Uh, a lot of people uh, join a gym and then never go, so I can't say that uh, everybody will benefit that belongs to it. Uh, but the, the health club, everything there is local. The idea of the whole development of all the retail will be locally served. Nothing is a destination-based retail. It's all for people that live in the area, people that can live in the building, and people that live in the surrounding buildings. That concludes our questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having us. Are there any speakers that have not submitted a speaker slip? I mean, you have to.
you, you yes. can make a public comment, but we'd like you to do a speaker slip. So right after your comments, you could uh, fill out that slip. I'd like to acknowledge the other co-chair of uh, Community Board 13 Land Use Committee, Jerome Rukowski. <coughs> You can come speak first and fill it out, though. First. Hi, my name is R. Rose. I'm, I'm a resident on Neptune Avenue. Um, this uh, parcel is a place where people from the towers, uh, Trump Village, Warbass, Luna Park, Brightwater, uh, converge at this site. This is their spot. They descend from the towers, and this is where they congregate and then go to the beach. They congregated there for temple, other things. And then maybe they play chess or sit in the park, um, push their strollers through the park, their children play in the playground, and then they go to the beach. So this is a very, very important piece of property rel you know, relative to the community. Um, and so I'd like, just like to say that for decades, this corner has been extremely safe for the elders. Elders living there for decades feel extremely safe crossing that street because it's been a quiet street. <laughs> and when you put commercial, you're going to change that whole character. It's not going to be a quiet street anymore. The commercial needs to attract cars. Uh, part of the presentation of developer is that a parking voucher will be provided, free parking voucher will be provided if you uh, are a customer of the store. So they're expecting car traffic to the commercial, destroying the uh, safety for the elders. Um, <clears throat> Second of all, this is uh, really a piece of public land. This is in the critical piece of land <laughs> facing Astor Levy Park at the bottom of Ocean Parkway, facing the New York Aquarium and the boardwalk. So it really, it's, it's like a piece of public land. It, need, it, needs, it needs city involvement, and it, it really needs a, a careful analysis. And uh, I have done a little bit, uh, and I would like to make a suggestion that we, uh, as a city, develop a bike plaza on the east end of Astor Levy Park. Um, that's historically what was there. There was a bike storage and a plaza for bicyclists. And, but that west side of the park where the development is needs to be pedestrian safe. Uh, I'm in favor of the parking lot. Commuter, people need to commute to Long Island, places not uh, publicly accessible by, trans, uh, by city transit. So people need parking. There is, an, a, there is an undersupply of parking in the area. But the parking lot entrance needs to be on West Brighton Avenue, right there. West Brighton Avenue is an interconnector street. It's a pass-through street. It is, it, it is in between two, wa it's walkable distance from two subway stops and three bus stops. And, and it connects West Fifth Street to Ocean Parkway and Brighton Beach Avenue and the Bell Parkway. This is a connector street meant for people to just pass through, not to linker like this photo. So I think that the entrance to the parking lot must be located on West Brighton Avenue, not <coughs> located on Seabreeze Avenue, which needs to be remain safe for the community that has been using it for 60 plus years. Um, furthermore, the retail in worldwide is in a shambles. Vacancy rates at an all-time high. We don't really know why. To add a commercial district is reckless. It is Bernie Madoff-esque. There is no demand for retail for a new commercial district, especially in this area that is bounded by bustling historic commercial districts. Neptune Avenue, Brighton Beach Avenue, Coney Island Avenue, and West A Street, all within walkable distance of this critical parcel. So hear ye, hear ye. Let's get back to city business. Let's keep our zoning the way it is. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. So we have uh, no other speakers on this matter, and if you could fill the card, great. Appreciate. I'd like to bring up Mr. Platnick to give clarity. So the building is up to 20 stories. Yes. The curb cut is already in place. I don't know park. if he's constructed the, uh, the curb cut yet. The but, the, fence, but. but the 
parking, the way the building is set up on the ground floor, if you could provide clarity, if you can't do it tonight, to get back to us to explain what is firm or ready with parking garage entrance and what is not feasible because of the way the, the layout is based on the construction to date. I'm not sure what you're asking, but it's been laid out actually. I, I, I respectfully disagree with the young woman that just spoke. I think most of her concerns are invalid and not relevant to what we're talking about but right now. Show the ground so, plan. right. So this is this is this where the, the curb cut would be to the right of what you're seeing right here, and I could show it to you on a plan here. So, okay, so, so the curb cut would be on the sea breeze side. Right there, right? you and see it right there. Where it says parking entrance, 22 feet wide. Yes. And that's what filed at the billings department. That's now. what's filed at the department. And that's already now. been approved by the billings department. Yes without consideration of changing the use. The zoning, that's permitted, right. That's more community facility use to now less community facility use that would be backfilled by some <coughs> retail use and some physical health up. So your application does in effect where the curb cut is filed today. Correct, the curb cut is completely independent of what we're asking for, if that's where you're going, yes. It has nothing to do with it. And it's to some degree I guess in progress already because the building's already up 20. The building has all been designed around the location of the curb cut right there. So everything is built, everything is in place. Whether or not the curb cut itself is in right, place, the, everything's the been designed around setup. it being, so yes. All but, but for the builder's pavement plan that will be consistent to yes. match the ground floor that's already been constructed. Yes, That correct. part's been set. Yes. So thank thank you. you for the clarity. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking. Okay, if there are no other uh, speakers, Richard, if you could please close this calendar item. Calendar item number three is closed. Calendar item number four, 190256 ZMK, 190257 ZRK. This application submitted by EMP Capital Group pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for the following actions. A zoning map amendment to change corner portions of two blocks fronting Grand Avenue and both sides of Pacific Street from M1-1 to R7D and establish a C2-4 commercial overlay within the proposed rezoning area and a zoning tax text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area contiguous with the rezoning and boundaries in Brooklyn Community District 8. Such actions would facilitate the development of 979-984 Pacific Street, a nine-story, approximately 56,000 square foot, mixed-use commercial and residential building with a 64 dwelling units, of which 16 would be permanently affordable to households at an average of 60% of area median income pursuant to MIH option one. Community Board 8 in, intends to vote on this application on November 14th, 2019. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decisions until he hears from the board. Would Richard Lobel, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Good evening. Once again, we are here to present a rezoning to the Borough President's office. I'm joined immediately to my left by Nick Liberis from Alba Liberis Architects, the project architects on this matter, as well as Ellie Pariente, who is the applicant. The application is for the Grand Avenue and Pacific Street rezoning, which is a rezoning area located within the circled area on the map. Uh, you will notice that the area is currently located within an M11 zoning district. So the specifics of the rezoning involve uh, one full lot on the northern portion of Pacific Street at this intersection, as well as uh, four and a portion of a fifth lot on the southern portion of the uh, street corner. So the proposed rezoning right now, as was stated, would rezone the properties from an M11 zoning district to an R7D district with a C24 overlay. And this, of course, is the uh, picture of the focus on the southern portion of the uh, of the rezoning area. Um, so there's many things to note with regards to land use in the area as well as to the zoning map generally. First is that um, the area is a mixture of various different zoning districts. Um, there are R7D districts existing within the general area. Uh, you can see to the north uh, portion or the top right portion of the, uh, of the map. These were, I believe, rezoned as part of the Bed-Stuy South rezoning 
in um, 2007. Uh, and in 2013, in the Crown Heights West rezoning, much of the uh, area to the south and east of the, of the parcel was rezoned. Uh, many of these residential zoning districts were rezoned to contextual districts, districts uh, including R7A districts with inclusionary zoning. Uh, at the time, the M11 uh, properties were left out of this rezoning, which gave rise to uh, many factors, one of which is the M1, uh, the M Crown rezoning uh, subcommittee of Community Board 8, which we've attended frequently and also have approached with various applications. Most recently, uh, the applications which have gone through the Community Board have been for the two districts which appear on the same block. Uh, and on the block to the east of class and from the subject rezoning site, you see an R7A zoning district with a commercial overlay, a C24 overlay, as well as an M14R7A district to the east of class. And these were done uh, and were approved, finally approved in May 2019, so relatively recently. So here is a, a focus on the zoning change map, which demonstrates the street corners which were included. Grand Avenue uh, is generally understood to be uh, different in scale than many of the surrounding avenues uh, and as can be discussed in greater detail the M crown subcommittee's own resolutions have um, dictated different bulk and uses that would be available on this block and on this frontage as opposed to other frontages within the general area and you can see pictures of the rezoned area uh, primarily occupied by vacant lots uh, so we are, as was the case in prior rezonings, very much looking forward to the proposed development. Uh, the plans and zoning calculations are included in the pages that follow. This would, as was discussed, be for a nine-story building. It would be ground floor commercial use at the site, uh, as well as residential units above. The residential units would total approximately 64 units. Of these 64 units, in accordance with mandatory inclusionary housing, which would be mapped uh, district over the site, uh, there would be 16 affordable units. Uh, which, uh, as proposed by the applicants, would be at option one. So we have uh, floor plans and zoning calculations and other um, plans relating to the site, which uh, at the borough president's discretion, we're happy to discuss in detail. Uh, I, I know that, as is typical, that there's many questions that, are, that have arisen, and we're, we're happy to answer those with specificity, both myself as well as um, our architect, Nick Liberis, and, and Ellie, the, uh, the applicant. So we actually have about seven or eight questions. Oh, great. <laughs> First question, uh, Community Board 8 has updated M Crown zoning recommendations for its M11 district based on the Department of City Planning's M Crown framework, which contains this proposed rezoning. Please describe in what ways the requested zoning district and the extent of envisioned use are consistent with CB8's vision for M Crown. So the, the M Crown zoning framework as was most specifically set forth recently in its September 2019 resolutions designated this area um, beginning on the block south of Atlantic Avenue along Grand Avenue as a mixed use sub area which in accordance with the M Crown resolutions was really called out for several factors the first was that they they wanted to ensure ground floor commercial use uh, they wanted to uh, maintain bulks, a bulk FAR of between four and five, uh, and also discussed typical affordability in accordance with um, with uh, MIH guidelines. And and uh, as per MIH, 50% of the units here would have a preference for the local community board. So, with regards to consistency with those M Crown resolutions, the zoning districts that's proposed is at a 5.6 FAR, the R7D, uh, and that compares favorably with the 4 to 5 FAR, as was included in the uh, M Crown subcommittee recommendations. The ground floor commercial use here, one of the great things about the R7D district is that when it is paired with the C24 commercial overlay, the ground floor commercial uses are mandated at the site. So, um, and and I know that Richard talked about this at the uh, at the sub, at the committee hearing, but there is a certain amount of non residential floor area that's required here so um so the site as proposed has roughly 8,000 square feet of ground floor commercial uh, of which um gr greater than 2,000 square feet would be reserved for proposed m crown uses uh gib vaconi who spoke uh with regards to the application 
at the sub, at the committee hearing said that this was um, above what was typically required for the Grand Avenue properties, and that in uh, that for Grand Avenue, uh, many of them I, I think that some of these properties were not actually required to have M Crown uses, but the applicant here is. Uh, is asking to provide 25% uh, of those uses. Uh, in addition, we, we're using option one, which is um, allows for lower level of affordability than uh, the, as between that and option two, which is the two the two choices that are generally used in most rezonings. Okay, last year CBA disapproved 1010 Pacific Street, which was proposed as um, an upzoning from M1, M11 to R7D on the grounds that such height and bulk was excessive for the area. On the board's recommendation, the City Planning Commission modified the requested R7D district to R7A. Given the board's position, why was it deemed appropriate to seek R7D zoning for this development? I think there's really two reasons why uh, <coughs> this rezoning sought R7D and, and, and felt that this was and the applicant felt um, justified in, in bringing that request. The first is that uh, the frontage here is on Grand Avenue uh, and Pacific Street. So you have a corner lot. Both areas of the rezoning in, involve um, have, have street frontages on Pacific and or Grand. And so the mid-block nature of the 1010 Pacific rezoning merited a, an R7A in accordance with the uh, M Crown subcommittee, the, the, um, the uh, Community Board 8 as well as the uh, City Planning Commission. Here with the greater frontage on, on Pacific Street and Grand Avenue, a greater percentage of frontage, it, uh, the, the decision was, was uh, that we would go with an R7D. I think more importantly than that is that the subcommittee's own recommendations were that uh, a higher FAR would attach to these properties along Grand Avenue. Um, the, there was uh, the mixed use sub area that's mid block as per the M Crown subcommittee recommendations, would merit a uh, lower floor area than the uh, than the properties along Grand. And so, given that they were in favor of an R7A mid-block, the next logical step uh, to allow for a greater bulk on the avenue would be an R7D. That's why the, this was chosen chosen uh, in comparison to the other rezonings. There was also there was a strong um, uh, feeling Nick, that there was sure. <laughs> Uh, Nick Labaris. Um So there was um, a strong feeling that there was uh, there was a very strong visual connection uh, to the um, Atlantic Avenue corridor too. So you're at the nexus over here between three or four different neighborhoods, and it has a certain prominence. So you know everybody understood that what what we were going to get configurationally was something that could that could yield some more uh, some more bulk. And you'll see uh, when we describe the building how we've how we've used that uh, to um, a great effect. Uh, that's uh, that seems to be very very supported by the community. And I'd finally just add that the. R70 benefits from mandating ground floor commercial use, and this was a goal of the M Crown subcommittee that commercial use carry through here. Were this to be an R7A, there'd be no zoning mechanism in place to guarantee that ground floor commercial use. So, yet another reason why the R70 was deemed appropriate. Sorry, I just got warm. So. Yeah, we all did. <laughs> So the presented rendering depicts a nine-story building, though the requested zoning allows 11 floors. And there was representation that the ground floor would be devoted to ground floor use, including approximately 2,000 square feet on ground floor area, would be devoted to M Crown use. What guarantees that the represented, represented building height, ground floor occupancy, and what M Crown uses would be allowable in the space intended for a dedicated space? So. Uh, I would first know that Ellie, um, uniquely in this area, uh, as in my experience as far as applicants are concerned, has attended almost every uh, M Crown subcommittee meeting. Uh, we find him to be uh, in the range of applicants to be one of the more uh, concerned and involved applicants that we've had, and has had himself, even separate from our representation, his own conversations with the community, the community board, and leaders on the community board. So I think that there is, in a certain sense, a level of good faith and trust that's arisen between him and the and, and uh, local residents. Um, this is an issue with regards to um, such guarantees that we face on a regular basis on many applications. Um, for the most part, we uh, make representations to the borough president's office. We typically will uh, uh, submit a develop developer's letter to the uh, to the council and to the council, the affected council member. 
and, um, and, and typically that's the extent of the commitments that are made. Uh, it's the good faith of the applicant and, the, and essentially going out there and saying, this is what we want to commit to. Um, I note that in the past there's been discussions at the council regarding restrictive declarations um, and that generally speaking the land use uh, division at the council has uh, demonstrated that they would prefer not to have these restrictive declarations. So um, there's questions and this is a recurring legal question with regards to enforceability of these restrictive declarations and um, parties who would be responsible for, for enforcement. Uh, the legal issues have outweighed uh, the ability of the council to use restrictive declarations. Um, so in the past, even the city planning commission would allow for restrictive declarations to attach to properties and rezonings. This is now lo no longer the case as a city policy. Um, so uh, we are currently in discussions with the community board and, and trying to give as much assurances as we can, both for the height of the building as well as for the, um, for the uses that would be guaranteed. But at a minimum, we will set that forth in writing for the record and, and um, we're looking forward to fulfilling our promise. So although there may be hesitation expressed by bodies within the city council, <coughs> would there be an objection to filing a covenant on the property that says basically the building would have 2,000 square feet of property of the following range of uses and that the height of the building plan submitted would be nine stories? You know, you file it prior to the council votes. Yes, the issue of who can challenge if a plan goes to the building department contradiction. I, I understand that point, but it's still a legal document that does have a mechanism. Yes, it takes fundraising to challenge, but it still is a legal document. Would there be openness to pursuing such a document? Yeah, so um, I, I'm going to speak. I'll let Ellie add to the extent he wants to add anything. Um, obviously, we're in ULERP. This is a, a process that takes six months on, on average. Um, and. I, I, I think in principle, I'd want to further discuss it with Ellie. In principle, I think that um, a restrictive declaration might be okay. Um, I don't, and, and I think at that point it would be more uh, for show than anything. I mean, obviously, um, to the extent that it becomes a central issue as this uh, proceeds through ULERP, I think that it's going to be a serious consideration on our part. I know that there's maybe other mechanisms which may be available. Um, which we're looking into, but um, but again, um, I know from my personal conversations that Ellie is committed to these factors around the building. I think um, particularly in light of the M Crown uses. So the M Crown uses, I think, are of particular importance given the fact that the underlying bulk with regards to the community board was acceptable. And so I think really the commitment, as far as I'm concerned, would be one that would be surrounding the 25% M crown uses. Uh, I would so I, I think that that as far as getting that substance, a commitment as far as that, that substance of that discussion, I think is something that we are moving towards. Um, and um, I'd also say that the M crown uses as as is, and because it's really you need to really dig and and discuss in order to find the particularities that the M crown uses are actually more expansive than we thought they were, including use groups three and four. And so this is something which even prior to any discussion of M crown uses, Ellie has discussed the possibility of those community facility uses in the building. So so I have I have every faith and confidence that we will proceed in this in this on this path and that we'll be able to provide a commitment which will make. Uh, the uh, interested parties satisfied. You want me to sure. Um, my name is Eli Pariente, uh, applicant, as Richard mentioned. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know what to add to what Richard has said uh, other than confirming that, yes, we do intend on implementing the M Crown tenancy within the building. We've been in conversations uh, with the land use subcommittee, who has also proposed you know, different mechanisms in order to enforce the M Crown use. Um, the covenant that you mentioned, the restricted declaration is one of the, is one of the path that, that we see. Um, I personally have no issues uh, recording it. I will obviously follow count my counsel and my architects to make sure that, you know, we don't hurt the property, but uh, we already have, I mean, I, I wouldn't say negotiation, but we've already uh, discussed the space with a couple of tenants that have been in the market in the neighborhood and have a very good idea of what kind of tenants uh, we could fit into this space that actually really, really um, uh, fit the M Crown uses as described uh, by the community board. So 
I mean, at this point, it's really more of a legal issue because we have all the intent of setting it up, of implementing it. Um, what legal mechanism we use to give those assurances, I leave that to my, you know, uh, counsel. But uh, we have no issues, implement, you know, signing whatever we have to sign to make sure that uh, that it gets built oh, this way. Oh, wow. Not signing, yeah, but, <laughs> but like, you know, implementing whatever mechanism. Yeah, also, uh, just a little bit of color for for this, too. Um, I, I think that uh, with an R, R7D, uh, with with this type of non, uh, non like luxury product, um, you wouldn't typically max out because the uh, the, the gains that you get uh, from higher rents wouldn't be offset by the increased construction cost over here. So I, th I think that you're not going to end up, there's there's almost no no way that you would mass this efficiently and, and, and end up with a, uh, you know, uh, with like a maximum height. Um, I would not recommend, however, that there be any hard cap on this height because there are, there always are, you know, uh, there might be some sort of first floor tenant. Uh, there might be some sort of decision to place, um, like the place community facilities, not, not I'm, I'm sorry, um, the, the uh, rec space, um, like the quality housing rec space. Um, up on the roof, you know, which which might in uh, in in uh, in the end give you a, a tenth floor, you know, something like like this. But um, you know, I, th I think you could you could safely make um, an assumption that it's not going to get near that that uh, that 115 foot height. Um, but it may hit 10 10 floors, you know, depending on certain configurational things. But most of, uh, most probably not. Okay. So the next question actually is a three part question. Deals with affordable housing. Um, first, first part, what is the qualifying income range for prospective households based on household size? Second question, what are the anticipated rents based on the number of bedrooms? And the third part would be, what is the distribution of units by bedroom size? So um, the conversation with uh, Council Member Cumbo to date has been around a 60% AMI option one. Uh, as such, for the studios ones and twos in the building, um, the average 60% uh, of AMI would be roughly $44,820 for a studio through $57,660 for a two bedroom. Um, those rents would range from, uh, again, this is the average number, $856 for a studio, through $1,309 for a two bedroom. Uh, and as far as the breakdown in unit sizes, the intention would be for 13 studios, uh, a, a majority of the units at a one bedroom uh, size of 35, that would be 35 units, and then the two bedrooms would number 16 units. Uh, as the borough president's office is aware from voluminous information and other hearings, the 10% um, of, of that 25% number would be at 40% of AMI, which would uh, provide for um, AMIs uh, at 40% of 29,880 through 38,440, and rents of $535 through $828, with, of course, um, potential maximums exceeding the 60% in order to maintain a 60% average. Again, this is this is always going to be vetted through H H B B D, you know. So, you know, the typical unit breakdown might be might be slightly different in the end, but that's you know that's generally what what we'll be shooting for. Do you have the chart in your? Is it in there? Uh, I don't know if it's in the. It's on one of the plan sheets. <coughs> the the plan sheets maintain uh, the bedroom counts. Oh. Right there. Oh, but it doesn't have yeah. the rents. The rents are not included. Okay. Yeah. That's the next question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. Um, we we do have a hard copy of just of the of the AMS. Okay. I just want to. Sure. Do you need to? You want to see? Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. <clears throat> the the next question deals with community concerns um, regarding displacement. Um, Please identify what marketing strategies, such as designating one of the community's affordable housing nonprofits as the affordable housing administering unit, uh, administrating agent. Which, would such marketing strategies start off with a financial literacy campaign to assist area residents in becoming lottery uh, eligible? So given the, the, uh, the fact that we are going through ULERP and hopefully approaching a, uh, an eventual approval, but that we're not there yet, 
Um, we've, we're very preliminary in our discussions regarding um, regarding our, an administering agent, which would be required pursuant to MIH regulations. Uh, understanding this, we have begun outreach to particularly two organizations. One of those is Impact, and the second is NHS Brooklyn. Um, this is basically after consultation with Councilmember Cumbo, who um, herself has uh, mentioned that she uh, favors um, the certain non certain nonprofits which are very active in the area, and those are two of them. Uh, there was a third, but they they uh, uh, after reaching out to them, uh, we confirmed that they're not actually an administering agent, so they came off of our list. But um, but these are two uh, um, nonprofits who we've identified and would will be in further discussions with as potential administering agents, and in that context would have um, further conversations with them about community outreach, about uh, attempting to um, to particularly attract rent burden households within this area. Uh, and maximize the percentage of CBA residents, as well as uh, for the conduct of financial literacy courses and, and allowing for um, families to become lottery eligible. Uh, we understand that they've done impact, both Impact and NHS Brooklyn have done work in this area and um, would, be, uh, would be excellent choices, either one. And the third group, by the way, if it makes sense, if they have a good track record of reaching out, even though they may not be able to serve an administering agent, if they work to help the neighborhood pool of people move forward, you know, there's no reason to preclude them if additional services make sense. Absolutely happy to do that. The next question deals with the borough president's policy is to promote the use of sustainable and renewable energy. Um, it is also the borough president's policy to promote practices to retain stormwater runoff. What consideration has been given possibly in Corporation with the Department of Environmental Protection, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, NYSERDA, or NYPA, towards incorporating passive house des design, solar panels, wind turbines, blue, green, or white roof covering, and or DEP rain gardens. Uh, so the site um, is, uh, um, it's at the corner, <clears throat> and as such, uh, we could do 100% 100 lot, lot covers, so we end up with a lot of roof and what we're able to do with this is uh, to detain 100% of the water coming in on these, on these roofs. Uh, we have setback roofs, we have the top roof, we have the roof that's at the second floor. And what, what this allows us to do is, um, in effect, have something which over uh, most of its surface is a, um, a de facto green roof in that um, it performs that, that, uh, that, that way. It's a high R, R roof, uh, which has been engineered to retain water. Um, and this is um, this is standard city policy. This is one way uh, that you could comply with it. Uh, this is what we're proposing over here. Um, the white roof portions. I mean, I, I, you guys must be uh, uh, like must be like aware of this thing that's coming down the pike right now. You know that uh, I think it's in effect in the next couple couple weeks now, uh, where you have to do solar panels, you have to do green roof of some sort. You know, there's exceptions for for this. So this is actually going to be covered now uh, by the zoning. So uh, in in our case, um, there are um, exceptions. Um, uh, that would cover uh, areas that are rec space, you know, so we do plan on having rec space at that second floor roof um, and also possibly on the uh, top roof. But because we have to retain water there, uh, you end up basically with that same same depth. So it's an effect, you know, that uh, the white roof then uh, would be germane uh, for the mechanical bulkheads, for the elevator bulkhead. Uh, so we're going to have that there, and that's going to be uh, uh, com uh, compliant. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we are working with Ellie right now to help him on certain other projects. Uh, so we're helping him source uh, source windows uh, from the suppliers uh, that we generally use, and uh, uh, the foreign windows. Um, and uh, the um, uh, the windows that you get um, out of Europe are almost all uh, triple plane. So um, it's it's actually cheaper to get triple pane uh, uh, than it is to get double pane over here. Um, so. Um, while we won't be passive house, uh, we'll still have the building components of a, of a passive house building, uh, namely uh, the beefy windows. Uh, uh, we will be super insulated. We've been using a product that's called Cool Therm uh, for the past couple of years, which gives an R of uh, four, 14 over two, two inches. Um, this is a product which has been developed um, um, originally in uh, the 1930s uh, for commercial refrigeration buildings, which were pre prefab. Um, it's extremely high, high R. 
Um, the main thing that keeps us uh, from doing passive house is um, is a testing protocol. Um, it's a very rigorous testing protocol, and we find that it doesn't really make make sense uh, for these types of developments just because it's too it's too big. Uh, the energy code has has an exception uh, which lets you um, which lets you by, bypass this, and we have done it uh, with another building, um, but we still had a very difficult time signing it off. So to be honest, I don't know that uh, we will be recommending it for this building, but in the end, it's a it's a very um, uh, sustainable building. Um, it's very I would say conscious of um, of all these factors, and um, you know ultimately, as we all know. Uh, the energy code keeps uh, keeps getting more and more restrictive, and uh, we have to satisfy it. Um, we um, we've been seeing audits on almost every single job uh, for the past 18, 18 months, and uh, we've been successfully passing them because what we're always doing is uh, something uh, which goes above and beyond, you know, which is what we're going to be doing here. So, um, you know, I don't think it's going to be um, an issue um, uh, regarding. Um, I, I, I think you said something about bio bio spills. Did someone the the rain garden? So since Bustles, okay. <laughs> so uh, the only places that we could really do them are in uh, the tree pits, you know, because everything else, um, you know, because we are trying to keep keep the building low. Um, we don't really have so much room uh, to play with these roofs. What happens with these setback roofs is that you have to have slab drops, so you end up basically lowering the ceiling height underneath. So to do something uh, with that depth, um, it's not is not really uh, feasible with this height uh, with this height building. Um, so uh, you know we could do it in the sidewalks. We've definitely looked at it uh, before. It's something that we can investigate. Um, again, it's not something that I would commit to because it, it uh, may not be possible. Uh, or um, what we also run into often is any time that we get uh, into bed with DEP or DOT, uh, we get into situations where we're prevented from getting CFOs because it's impossible to get an email answered. So um, you know I'm, I can't commit to that, uh, but we will look into it. The last question actually deals with the, um, the borough president's policy in terms of maximizing good quality jobs. Please outline what steps will be taken to ensure the inclusion and participation of minority and women-owned business enterprises and local business enterprises in the process of construction on this site. Um, so I think I'd speak and then I'd let Ellie add any comments. Um, you know, having been familiar with uh, the borough president's policy, we um, look forward to uh, engaging M MWBE as well as LBE um, businesses in order to um, maximize their involvement in the construction. Um, I know that the applicant here, that Ellie, in his previous construction has had a very high percentage of uh, subcontracting jobs given to MWBE subcontractors, and um, I know you can discuss that, um, but um, you know we can, we can probably discuss that further internally as far as the numbers are concerned, but I have every confidence, given his track record, that uh, it will not be an issue for us to satisfy, um, you know, certain standard minimums that have been set forth before. Uh, also, in addition, for what it's worth, the property and uh, the owner intends to proceed for, in the in the event that the rezoning is successful, to engage uh, in uh, 421A relief, uh, and as such, um, there will be certain assurances built in within those regulations as well. Um, but uh, Ellie, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't mean to uh, get more credit than is deserved, but in reality, what uh, Rich just said is that by bidding out, by starting to bid out the, the job and getting a sense of what trades we would use, literally by accident, found out that literally four or five of our more common uh, trades have recently been qualified as minority owned and are you know um, already qualified as one of the vendors that uh, will be satisfying the requirements so I, I can't I can't say that I you know it, it that I looked for it but literally our elevator guy still guys a lot of our main uh, trades uh, have notified me that uh, they had a certification so it's really more of a coincidence than anything else but obviously as rich said we will make sure that if, you know, we, we focus on hiring as many of them as possible. Okay, that concludes our questions. We have speaker slips. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Thank Again, you. there have been people who joined the room. If you're looking to speak at a site, you should fill out a speaker slip. If people in the room came for an earlier item and they'd like to speak at that item again, fill out a speaker slip. Okay, we have Shay Barry from 32BJ.
Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening. My name is Shay Barry, and I'm here tonight on behalf of my union, 32BJ, and the over 3,000 32BJ members who live and work in Community District 8. As you know, our members clean, maintain, and secure residential buildings like 985 Pacific Street. We believe that in order to create a more balanced New York, developers should commit to providing a prevailing wage building service job. Historically, these jobs have allowed working families from diverse backgrounds, upward mobility, and security. Good jobs that paid prevailing wage are imperative for working people to sustain life in New York City. We estimate that this development will create about five property service jobs. These jobs should help uplift working families and give workers dignity. Currently, there is no commitment to provide prevailing wage building service jobs at this site. However, the developers seeking this rezoning have expressed interest in making a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage jobs to the future building service workers at this site. We respectfully request that you urge the developer to commit to good jobs that pay prevailing wages as part of your recommendation for this project. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, A.M. Goodrich. <coughs> Again, oh, <coughs> again, so on behalf of the group called Carantine and also River River Forum, um, I want to say the reason that I had to reject or against this plan is because we're in the midst of the so-called affordable housing crisis that they played for over 16 years. So we, so our solution, our platform, to make sure to house homeless families um, um, and, and to make sure to have local hiring to help benefit the people in the community. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Like over 72,000 homeless families and people living on the street and also on mass transit system see why. That is, why, that is way, way worse than the national average or the New York State average. But in, but in addition, um, because of um, other, like the income and um, value, um, people have to make um, between 22,000 and 46,000 a year. In annual in, in, in income, so, so our solution, our platform, they should um make sure to create all the units to house homeless families, senior citizens, veterans, and working class families in between. For people making um people have to make thirty to over to thirty between thirty to sixty percent of the local area median income. That means here CB eight and beyond. So this is like a hardworking, middle class, diaper, culturally, um, culturally um, community for their family, senior, and veteran for generations to, to, to come. So because they have, uh, you have like the 65, you have the, with it on um, Burger and Dean, you got 25 of folks and 26 run by Fulton and um, folks folks should be served by CB2, and also on the 48 was run by Classen and um, Franklin Avenue. So, but the, so that's the reason uh, our solution is to make sure that the demand like real community land trust, make sure to buy like low income housing for like for families in need. So that is my point of view. Thank you. Are there any other speakers before we close this item? Okay, hearing none, Richard. Would you please close the calendar item? Calendar item number four is closed. The hearing on these items is now closed. Thank you for participating in the public hearing. Borough President Adams will review the applications we heard today and will soon submit his recommendation to the City Planning Commission. Borough President Adams would like to take this opportunity to remind you that the City Planning Commission will hold a public hearing on these items. The hearing is now adjourned. Borough President Adams would like to remind those viewing on the website that timely comments can be submitted by email to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. Richard, I know you mentioned that. Uh,